reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel chapter 16. We're going to be looking at chapters 16 and 17, parables of rebellion. The scene is, oh, around 592, 596, and uh, Jerusalem is in rebellion. And God has been warning her repeatedly for nearly 40 years through this man, Jeremiah, the prophet we covered before, and also a, a prophet not quite so long, but for a period of time, Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel has already been taken captive to Babylon because of rebellion, and not because of his rebellion, but the nation's rebellion. He's a prophet and he's a priest and he's already in Babylon. And he's telling the people in Babylon that unless Jerusalem turns around, they're going to end up as we are in captivity. So you have Jeremiah in Jerusalem and you have Ezekiel in Babylon. They're saying the same thing. Repent from your idolatry. A message very much uh, pertinent for today. What is idolatry? Idolatry really is putting anything or anyone in the place of God. And they had all sorts of idols. They had idols of every description. They dragged them right into the temple. Uh, and instead of worshiping Jehovah, they were worshiping Molech or Ashtoreth or uh, any of the other gods and goddesses. So God was warning them and he said, you're going to go into captivity. You're going to be punished if you do not give up the idolatry. Well, they did not listen. He tried everything. He tried words. Uh, he tried uh, stories. And now he's trying parables anything to get their attention. God will do whatever he can to reach us. Nobody could ever say, well, God never warned me. He does everything he possibly can to reach. So we find now in chapter 16, the parable of the adulterous wife. Uh, we're going to be able to see in this parable God's relationship with Jerusalem, and we're going to see God's relationship with us. Because when you and I are faithful to God, we are basically married to God. When we are not faithful, we are committing adultery, spiritually speaking. We are going to someone else and cheating on him. So we're going to look at the parable of the adulterous wife in chapter 16. In chapter 17, we're going to look at it in a little different light. The parable of the two eagles. Sometimes we like to look at the animal kingdom to get a picture of what's going on in our lives. So we'll see that in chapter 17. So let's ask God for help and let's dig right in. Father, we're grateful for this chance to look at your word, understand it, follow it. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen and amen. Chapter 16 of the uh, book of Ezekiel, let's look at uh, chapter 16, verse 1. Uh, part 1, I think, is uh, verses 1 to 43. A lot of verses in here, but he's going to drive home the point. Give up your idolatry or you're going to go into captivity. So he says in chapter 16, verses 1 to 43, that Jerusalem's like an adulterous wife. He talks about how he loved her. He picked her up uh, from nothing in verses 1 to 14, and it's kind of a rags to riches story. And he loved her. Uh, but look at verses 15 to 30 as we get into that. She became a spiritual harlot. He loved her and he wanted her to be pure and faithful to him, but she became a harlot. And uh, she worshipped other gods and she made foreign alliances, trusting in everybody and everything except God. God's a jealous God. He wants to be first, last, and always in our lives. And he does not want anyone or anything taking his place. Well, in verses 31 to 34, she became an adulterous wife by cheating on him with other gods and alliances uh, with different nations. And then God is now going to use her very lovers, the ones she looked to for help, they're going to turn on her and destroy her. 
Kind of a very potent picture of our lives today. Well, let's stop at that point. That's a lot to digest, and let's go into it verse by verse. Uh, verses 1 to 43, Jerusalem is like an adulterous wife. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes or cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. What a sad picture of a birth, isn't it? Jerusalem was inhabited in the land of Canaan by the Jebusites. They were pagans. They were godless. When Israel came into the land in 1500, thereabouts before Christ, um, the Jebusites were strong in that land, and nobody could take the city. That The Canaanites were too strong. The Jebusites would repel all attacks. It finally took one king to be able to conquer that city. And the city was then named after him. And that, of course, was King David. About 500 years later, from the time they came into the land, he took that over. Well, Jerusalem was a Canaanite city until David took it over and brought worship of the Lord. He's talking about the birth of that city. Go back to verse 3, indicating here basically that before... I knew you and loved you, you were neglected. So verse 3, here's a sad picture about birth and nativity um, with the parents who are not uh, of God. They're Amorites and Hittites. As for your nativity, uh, your cord wasn't even cut. I've never been uh, present at the birth of a child, but I imagine that's just about the first thing they're going to do is cut that umbilical cord. And uh, that was not done for her. They would wash the, uh, the baby because of all of the blood on it. Uh, you were never washed. You were neglected. Rubbed with salt. That's not something we do today, is it? Any uh, nurses or doctors, we don't do that. But you know why they did that? Not so they could lick them and taste good, but that was supposed to cause the skin to tighten up on the body. And so they would rub it in salt to uh, get that skin to tighten up. Um, and then uh, not even wrapped in swaddling cloths. Um, so uh, the, at least Jesus had that. He didn't have much more at his birth. He was born in a stable, put in a feed trough, but at least he had some swaddling cloths. Um, but Jerusalem was totally neglected. Um, no eye pitied you, no open compassion was shown to you. You were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed or hated on the day you were born. Nobody loved you until me, the Lord says. Sadly, we can think in our minds about children today. There are children who are being thrown out. We hear about them being put into garbage cans and down toilets and horrible stories like that. Uh, back in Roman times, uh, they would have the city square and parents would go one step better than that. When they didn't want a child, they would take the child down to the city square and leave it there, hoping somebody might have compassion on that child and uh, raise the child. Well, we know the stories too about leaving children on the doorsteps of churches and things like that. So there are sad stories even today, not to mention the horrible alternative of abortion, where we simply don't even want to bring the child to, uh, to term and simply have it aborted. But we're not talking about uh, infanticide here. We're talking basically about neglect and our spiritual lives as well. What did the world do for you or me before Jesus Christ? Oh, you might have had good parents and gone to good schools and had some of the basic things in life, but what about spiritually? Who loved you? Who cared for you spiritually besides God? So when you look at your life, you were like this child, tossed out on the garbage heap of life until Jesus came and loved you and wanted to raise you and prepare you to be his bride. So always make application of Scripture for your life. It makes it so much more interesting, and it's really the purpose of the Scriptures to apply it to our lives. All right, so God is saying, I saw you as a baby, throw it out in the field, and neglect it, nobody loved you. He goes on to say, verse 6, When I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. 
I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. So here we find that she was struggling, Jerusalem was struggling for life, spiritually speaking, just struggling to be alive. God said, live. Think of your life and mine. I was 35 when I came to the Lord, and I was dead in my trespasses and sins, as Paul says. But the Lord said to me, live. Jerry, I want you to live. And I was struggling for life, trying to find God. I was living with a young lady at that point, and she said, I want to try to find God. And I said, who needs God? And she said, I do. I said, all right, I'll try to be a decent friend, and let's go find God. So we tried a few churches, and we eventually prayed, and the Lord brought us to, uh, to, to Christ on a long, circuitous route. But in any event, uh, the Lord said to me, live. And I had life. Well, God has then caused her to become beautiful, like a beautiful young lady, but she was bare. She was naked. And verse 8, when I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So he looked at Jerusalem, he looked at Israel, he loved her, and the time for love was there. The time for them to love God was there. And my time, as I say, came at the age of 35. Your time came at a different period in your life, the time when you were able to love, get beyond yourself, and love God. Well, he put his wing over her. Uh, it's a picture, really, of the mother hen, uh, of other birds, uh, even animals will protect them. Uh, there was uh, the story, a real story, too, of a forest fire. And uh, this uh, horrible forest fire took so many uh, trees and wildlife, and there they found this large, large bird, uh, a female, and she was dead. But uh, they were about to pick her up and toss her away, but then as they pulled her body off, little, little chicks began to come forth. She had some little offspring. She had covered them to protect them from the fire, and they survived even though she died. Well, God is spreading his wing. It reminds me of the story of Boaz and Ruth in, in the book of Ruth, a wonderful story there where God, through Naomi, the mother-in-law, says for Ruth to go to the harvest. Uh, she's in the field of a relative of Naomi named Boaz, and the harvest is, is full and rich, and they're drinking, and they're having a wonderful time, and the owner of the field, Boaz, uh, goes to sleep. Uh, and so Naomi says, go and lie down at the foot of his feet, and when he awakens, ask him to cover you. And so she lies at the feet of Boaz, and when he awakens, and he's startled in the middle of the night, he wants to know who she is, and she says, I'm Ruth, your servant, and uh, she uh, indicates to him that she needs a covering. And he takes his blanket and he puts his blanket over her. And that to me is a picture of covering. My wife Kelly and I did a wedding last night and uh, we had the chance to see a wonderful young couple, uh, a young doctor and uh, a wife, a nurse, uh, get married. And we had many analogies in mind and I was thought about Ruth and that. And here was but Matt is his name, and Matt uh, took uh, Abby to, or Allie to be his wife, and in a sense he was saying, I'm taking my wing, I'm taking my robe and putting it over you, I'm going to cover you, I'm going to protect you. And uh, I tried to tell some of the young fellows who want to know what's it going to take to get married, and I said, well, follow my example, first of all, and wait 71 years. They say, oh, well, what's plan B? They don't want that. And I said, well, plan B is that a woman is looking for a guy who is flashy, has a great car, who is hot and who sizzles, not. She wants someone who's going to, among other things, oddly enough, gals say they want a sense of humor, so that's why they all listen to Joel Osteen on the radio, I guess, with a great sense of humor. Uh, but more than a sense of humor, ladies want someone who's gonna be a provider for her and for the children, someone to put the wing over them to protect them. And God says, I did that for you. That should have been what you wanted. That should have been enough for you. Well, verse nine, I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood. I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth, gave you sandals of badger skins. I clothed you with fine linen and clothed you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists, a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. 
Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and you clothed, you were, your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. That's what he did for Israel. He presented himself at Mount Sinai to Moses and the people, and he wanted them to love him and to be faithful to him and to make him uh, their God. So she had all she could want. That's all a young lady would want, would be to be cared for and to have the fine things, but more than that, the love of her husband. And so I provided everything for you. I gave you wonderful food. Look at that uh, uh, fine pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. That speaks of the manna that they had in um, the 40 years of the wilderness. Uh, it was like coriander seed. I was Googling coriander to see what it's like. And it would be nice. It would be a, a lemony, slightly um, uh, Indian flavor of cumin in there too. And uh, they would have that for 40 years. Uh, I think of it without the cumin. I think about going to fairs. What's nice about fairs? Well, seeing the animals, but also the fried dough, right? Well, I, I gave you all that you could want. Uh, and your fame was well known. You were beautiful. I gave you everything that I could. I withheld nothing from you. Well, again, think about the day of your conversion. Think about the fact that you and I were struggling in our own blood, uh, blood of our own making, blood of our own sin, and God washed us with that blood of Jesus Christ, cleansed us from our own sins and gave us life. He said, live, and I'll make you beautiful. I'll make you an heir. Better than that, I'll make you a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You'll have all that you could ever want, and you're going to share my kingdom with me. And he said, my splendor, which I bestowed on you, I gave you my splendor. The splendor, not just in heaven, but the splendor right now. When you talk to a believer who loves Jesus Christ, there's a splendor. At the reception last night, Kelly and I were talking and, uh, to some people who were believers. And as I talked to this couple, they lived down in Hudson, uh, you could see the splendor and the joy of the Lord in their faces. They just radiated. And uh, little by little, some believers came up and began to identify themselves. And you could see the glory of the Lord, the splendor on their faces. It was just beautiful. Well, now verse 15 begins the section here. Uh, she became a harlot worshiped other gods, made foreign alliances. Beginning in verse 15, but, oh, that word but changes everything, doesn't it? I did all of this for you, but. You trusted in your own beauty, oh, played the harlot because of your fame, poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. You trusted in your own beauty. What does that mean? Kind of a spiritual narcissism, isn't it, huh? Kind of, um, God says, I'll give you glory, my glory. I want people to look at you, Jerry, and see Jesus Christ. But when I'm in sin, I don't want the glory of Jesus. I want the glory of Jerry. Look at me. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look at me and all that I am and all that I can be. And so God says, I gave you my beauty, and you're replacing it now with your own beauty. How sad. How sad. And that's why Paul says to us, Ladies, gentlemen, you look in the mirror, you get yourself ready, get yourself ready for the day, make your adjustments to be sure, but don't rely on the outward beauty. That's going to fade. Rely upon the beauty of an inward heart and spirit towards the Lord. Feeding on God's word, feeding on him, that's going to give you a beauty. And so I talked to the organist after the service yesterday and helped her down with her bag. She must have been 300 years old. God bless her. She was, uh, I didn't ask her her age, but I don't think I could count that high. She was so old. And uh, Kelly said, would you help her down the stairs? Uh, poor thing. But I admired her. She had to be well into her late 80s, probably close to 90, I would say. But there was a beauty. There was a glow about her. She began to talk about her father, who'd been a pastor in Connecticut and Long Island and what have you. Began to talk about the Lord and began to open up as we were just going down the stairs. And you could see she was getting, to me, younger and more beautiful. Her eyes, instead of just being dim, were a radiant blue. And she changed right in front of my eyes. And uh, she talked about the fact that she'd been in another church and that she didn't care for the politics on that and was praying for direction on where to go and um, just had a dream 
dream, she said, and in that dream, God said, get your organ music ready. So I went up and I got all my organ music ready. I didn't know why. And then I got a phone call from this very church we were at yesterday. And she said, the pastor said, I'd like you to play the organ. And she said, when? He said, in a half an hour. And well, she had all her music ready and she played. So, but she literally transformed from walking out that door as though she wasn't going to make it down the stairs to a car. I thought, my God, who gave her a driver's license? Uh, and, but she got younger and younger and more radiant. It was the joy of the Lord. She was not trusting in her own beauty, which, frankly speaking, uh, naturally had long since faded. But she had an inner beauty, and she was getting more beautiful every day until one day she will pass into the presence of Jesus, and that glory and beauty will be complete. Well, verse 15 is telling us about trusting in their own beauty. Lord, I need to make adjustments, but don't help me to trust in my own beauty, my own talents, my own wisdom. Let me trust in you alone, should be our prayer. Well, verse 16, you took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself. Remember the high places were the places where they worshiped the idols, the gods of their own making. So you had all sorts of garments multicolored. They played the harlot with them. Such things, he said, should not happen. You've taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and you've made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. So the gold and silver that I gave you, you made into images of Molech and Tammuz and on and on. And we do the same thing with our own money, don't we? We get our hands on that money and we can't give that first tenth to God even though he says it's his. Even though he says when, I, when you give me that tenth, I'm going to bless you beyond measure. You're going to have all that you could ever possibly hope. But I need that for the mortgage and I need that for my fun. And I've got this super duper restaurant I've got to take my friends to and impress them with. Spend all sorts of lavish money on it. And so I'll give it to you, God, when I have enough. Like I'm going to serve you, Lord, when I have time and I retire. That time never comes. Well, I gave you gold and silver, but I worked hard for it. I worked 40 hours a week or I worked two jobs. Well, God says the silver is mine and the gold is mine. But I worked hard, Lord, and Moses tells me it was God who gave me the strength to work. It was God who gave me the job to work. So it all belongs to him. But you took it and you used it for yourself. You used it for your idolatry instead of me. Well, he says in verse 18, you took your embroidered garments, covered them. You set my oil and my incense before them. So that oil that was supposed to be used for me and that incense you gave to your gods, that body that he gave us, that mind, the resources we then use for our own uh, addictions and our own behavior, which is sinful, which is wrong. Every time we're sinning, we're taking precious gifts that God gave us and we are spending them on the devil and ourselves. Verse 19, my food which I gave you, that pastry of fine flour, oil, and honey which I fed you, you set it before them as sweet incense. So everything I gave you, you gave to them. Those idols in your life, those things that steal your time from me. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Where you're, these were acts of harlotry, were they a small matter? So God gave them children, precious children. And what did they do? They took those children and they placed them on the molten hot metal image of the God of the Ammonites, Molech. And in order to please Molech, they burned their babies and they played the drums and played loud instruments to drown out the sound of the dying babies as they were being sacrificed. That's what idolatry does. It causes us to even to destroy our young. You've slain my children, offered them up by causing them to pass through the fire. In all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. That's a good verse to remember. Jerry, remember the day that I got you saved, pulled you out of that horrible mess that you were in, you know, that de depression, being dead in trespasses and sins. For, don't you forget about that. Go back and remember. Verse 23, then it was, after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, that you also built for yourself a shrine and made a high place for yourself in every street. You built your high places at the head of every road, made your beauty to be adored. 
abhorred rather, you offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry. You also committed harlotry with the Egyptians, your very fleshly neighbors, and you increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me to anger. So you began to worship all these gods, drag them even into the temple, put them at the head of every street. That speaks to us every time we have uh, idolatry on our mind, the things we shouldn't be doing that we are doing instead of serving God. And then verse 26 talks about false alliances. What was Egypt to Israel? Looking back in their history, what was Egypt to them? Going back a thousand years, they could say they were in bondage as slaves in Egypt. How did the Egyptians treat them? Horribly. Beat them, starved them, used them. And God said, never go back. Once I get you out of Egypt, don't you ever, ever go back. Egypt speaks to us of the old life, the life of sin, the life of self before Christ. Don't go back to that life, he says. He says, they were your fleshly neighbors. And you went back and tried to get an alliance with them. Why were they going back to Egypt? They didn't literally move back to Egypt, but they called on Egypt. Why? Because their enemies, Assyria first and then later on Babylon, were in the northeast. Look at your geography in your mind of Egypt, of uh, Israel. You go to the northeast, and that's modern-day Iraq, and a little further to the south, Babylon. Well, those were the powers at that time, and they wanted to avoid those powers, so they wanted to go in the opposite direction. So what's, what's opposite of northeast? Southwest. What's in southwest? Egypt. They were trying to get help from Egypt, and God says, don't go back to the world to try to escape the enemy. Come to me. When you've got a problem, don't try to make a false alliance. I need money. Who can I hit up in my family who, first of all, has the money to lend me? And secondly, will be a soft touch on not having to pay interest and not having to pay on time or not even pay at all. That's the person that I want to go to. Or if I have to go to a bank or I have to go to this friend or that friend, whatever the need is, we tend to go to the world, don't we? Go to God first. Lord, help. We talk about medical situation. First number we have in our minds is 911. We all know that, 911. Well, how about Jeremiah 33, 3? Call unto me, God said, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. I'm not saying don't call 911, but go to God first and say, Lord, how do you want to handle this? Doesn't take long to say that. Do we do this with the 911 and rush to the hospital and go through whatever? Or, Lord, can we touch for a divine healing right now in the name of Jesus? Go to Him first. But we're always going to the world, we're going to Egypt. Well, verse 27. Because they were going to Egypt, because they had all these idols, I stretched out my hand against you, diminished your allotment, or the amount of food, gave you up to the will of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. So I cut down your food, I cut down your strength, I allowed the Philistines to come in and take you over, and they were even embarrassed as pagans by your conduct. Sometimes Christian conduct is so bad, it makes the unbeliever wince with embarrassment and shame. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and still you weren't satisfied. They were going to the Assyrians for help. They were going to anybody who would help them instead of God. Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor Babylon or Chaldea, even then you weren't satisfied. How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. You're looking to everybody except me, and that's not right. Now he begins in verse 31, talking about her being an adulterous wife. You erected your shrine at the head of every road, built your high place in every street, yet you are not like a harlot because of your scorned payment or you score in payment, you were an adulterous wife. So you weren't even a professional harlot who gets money for her services. You were just a wife who was cheating on your husband and you got nothing in return. You are an adulterous wife. You take strangers instead of her husband. Men make payment to all harlots, but you made your payments to all your lovers and hired them to come to you from all around for your harlotry. Not only did you not uh, get money for going elsewhere, you paid. 
you paid. Can you imagine a prostitute who walks up to you and says, would you allow me to pay you so much for a few hours of pleasure or a few moments of pleasure? So you went ahead and you just paid them. You gave all the, the resources I gave you, the, the love, the, the strength, the power, the gold, the silver, this beautiful land, you gave it all to others. So you're the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot in that you gave payment, but no payment was given by you, therefore you're the opposite. So no one came to you and tried to seduce you. You went out looking for trouble on your own. Well, verse 35 now tells us about the section here of God will use your very lovers to destroy you. Verses 35 to 43, those that you went to for help are going to turn on you before you know it. Now then, O harlot, verse 35, Thus says the Lord God, because your filthiness was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your harlotry with your lovers, with all your abominable idols, because of the blood of your children which you gave to them, surely therefore I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. I will gather them from against you from all around and uncover your nakedness to them and they will see your nakedness. So all these nations you went to for help are turning against you, and in the end, all nations will come against you. I will judge you as a woman who, who breaks wedlock, sheds blood. Uh, verse 39, I will give you into their hand, and they shall throw you down, throw down the shrines, break down your high places, shall strip your clothes, take your beautiful jewelry, leave you naked and bare. And that's going to happen just a couple of years from the writing of this letter. In a few years, the final fall of Jerusalem will take place in 586 B.C. She'll be stripped. They're going to be totally and completely destroyed. The temple destroyed, their homes destroyed, the wall destroyed. All the gold and silver will be taken away to Babylon along with the valuable utensils. Verse 40, they'll bring an assembly against you. They shall uh, stone you with stones and thrust you through with their swords. They shall burn your houses with fire, execute judgments in your sight. Um, he goes on to talk about this horrible ending. I will lay to rest my fury towards you. My jealousy shall depart from you. I will be quiet and be angry no more because you did not remember the days of your youth but agitated me with all these things. Look at that word agitated. He really, we annoy God with our idolatry, don't we? He becomes very, very angry uh, when we do that. He's very jealous. He wants to be first. You shall not commit lewdness in addition to all your abominations. So we're going to see that Babylon's going to do that, as I said, in 586 B.C. She'll come back from Babylon 70 years later. She will not be in idolatry. But again, she's going to not be loving God and serving him. And they're going to be, the, the worst comes when she rejects God's Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus will come, offer himself. He'll be crucified about 33 A.D. In 70 A.D., just under 40 years later, She'll be destroyed again. The Roman army under Titus will come and surround her because of her rebellion. And again, fire will destroy the temple and the city will be destroyed. And to this very day, 2017, the Jews do not have a homeland from God's perspective. Yes, they have Israel. In 1948, that nation was established. But again, God is not truly the head of that nation because he wants to be the head of that nation through the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is not the time. There will be a time just before he comes known as the tribulation time. And that'll be the ultimate fulfillment of all these nations coming against her and against each other. They're going to gather at Armageddon and there's going to be such bloodshed that it's going to rise as high as the horse's bridles. And that is going to be the time when the Lord and we return, Revelation 19. Uh, so, uh, but the good news is, this is a lot of blood and gore we're talking about here, but there's going to be a happy ending. Let's hang on and, and see that happy ending. Uh, the second part of this chapter deals with uh, Jerusalem being like her sisters. We saw in the first part that she's like an adulterous wife. We got that image pretty clearly. Let's apply it to our lives. Lord, may I not be an adulterous wife. I'm betrothed, if you will, to the Lord Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. May I not cheat upon him. May I not look at someone else. May I look only at him. 
When you go to a function, uh, guys, and you start to look at pretty girls, your wife will probably give you a sharp elbow to the ribs and say, keep your eyes off her, look at me. Or it could be the opposite uh, uh, if the, the gal is looking at some guy. But spouses want to make sure you're looking at them and you're not jealous. God's the same way. Look at me. Don't look at anybody else. Well, now we see that she's like her sisters. Verse 44, uh, her wicked sisters were Samaria, the capital of Israel to the north. And remember Sodom of Sodom and Gomorrah way back in Abraham's time? So they received judgment for their sins. How could Jerusalem, who was even worse than they, hope to escape? So looking at verse 44, indeed, everyone who quotes Proverbs will use this proverb against you, like mother, like daughter. In my family, we heard the analogy that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You look at families, and it's amazing. Now, there are differences, but whether it's learned behavior, whether it's sometimes genetic, uh, who knows, it can be demonic. Uh, but when you've got uh, bad characteristics and qualities in the parent, and the child hangs around that parent, um, uh, there's a good chance of the child becoming just like the parent. You are your mother's daughter, loathing husband and children. You are the sister of your sisters who loathe their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. So you're taking after your sister, your older sister to the north, uh, Israel. Your elder sister is Samaria, that's the capital, who dwells with her daughters to the north of you. Your younger sister who dwells to the south of you is Sodom. That was way down in Edom, uh, across the Jordan River. You did not walk in their ways, nor act according to their abominations, but as if it were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all your ways. You were worse. You had their example. They were ahead of you, and they failed, and you didn't, didn't profit from it. You know, God holds us accountable not only for our own actions, but when he brings people and situations in our lives, he expects us to pay attention. And when we don't, we can pay the consequences of it. So when you go into that same pattern and you've seen someone else go through it beforehand, God says, you know, they, they didn't have any precedent. You have a precedent and you didn't follow that precedent. So you're going to be more guilty than they. As I live, verse 48, neither your sister Sodom nor your daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride fullness of food, abundance of idleness, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. So we talk about Sodom and why Sodom was destroyed, and uh, we like to talk about the fact that there was a homosexual factor there, uh, and there was, uh, but there was wickedness on every level. And uh, the wickedness is not just one sin like that of homosexuality, and when you talk about homosexuality and, and the sin that God hates, and not going to heaven, read the rest of that paragraph. It includes fornication and hatred and what have you. So as you're pointing fingers to others, fingers are coming back to us as well. We all sin. But here he says the real, pri real sin was pride, and that is the basis of all sin. It's pride. So look at the iniquity of your sister Sodom, verse 49. She and her daughter had pride. Fullness of food, abundance of idleness, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. So as we focus in on the sin of homosexuality, fornication, uh, whatever, God says, yeah, those are not the root cause. They're wrong, but you've got to go to the root cause. Doctors now tell us you need to go to the root cause when you're trying to treat a condition. You don't just deal with the symptoms. Let's get down to the cause. The cause for those sins, fornication, homosexuality, lying, uh, cheating, perversion, it's all pride. I will do it my way, not God's way. And so they were haughty, and that's why I had to deal with them. So when you're going to be dealing with any sin in your life or helping somebody else to deal with a sin in his or her life, go to the root cause. Short course in counseling, it's, and from the Bible, it's always, always, always pride. Get off the throne of your heart, put Jesus there, and ask God to direct. If you've got somebody who's caught up in a lifestyle that's not right, and you mentioned that the lifestyle is not pleasing to God, uh, and you struggle with your own situation here, just say this, 
Let's confess our sins. Let's ask Jesus to be on the throne of your heart. And let's ask Jesus to direct your life and that particular situation. And he will lead you away from that problem, that vice, that sin. And so it's always pride that's the root cause of all of our sins. So verse 51, the northern kingdom of Israel with Samaria, uh, Samaria did not commit half of your sins. But you've multiplied your abominations more than they and have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you've done. You have judged your sisters and you bear your own shame. Oh, we tend to judge others, don't we? I have a tremendous eye for picking up sin in somebody else's life. Well, Jesus talked about that, didn't he? We have the most amazing vision. We can look around the two by four in our own eye and see a speck in our brother's eye a half a mile away. It's amazing. Uh, whatever kind of a, must be a definition in the optometry for that, but it's certainly a sinful uh, definition at that. Um, verse 53 is going to talk about the fact that there's going to be restoration, though. When I bring back their captives, the captives of Sodom and daughters, uh, the captives of Samaria and her daughters, then I will also bring back the captives of your captivity among them, that you may bear your own shame, be disgraced by all that you did when you comforted them. So they're going to be restored when they repent. Uh, unless you do that, you're going to also suffer. Um, and uh, look at verse 60 now. Here's the wonderful covenant that he's going to give with them. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and younger sisters, for I will give them to you for daughters, but not because of my covenant with you. And I will establish my covenant with you that you shall know that I am the Lord. That's why he wants this covenant, to know that he's God. That you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame when I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. So what's the answer? Atonement. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is kofar. It means to cover. The blood of all the animals was simply to cover the sins for one year. In the New Testament, the word atonement means complete removal of those sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. So the solution for them will be the solution for us and for all you need to repent of your sins and provide uh, forgiveness through coming to my son, Jesus Christ. He's the one who offers atonement. He took the bread and said, this is my body given for you. Took the cup, this is the blood in the new covenant, the new covenant that we have in the blood of Jesus Christ. And then we have uh, quickly chapter 17 is going to talk about the parable in a different way. Sometimes we like to look at it uh, uh, in a different perspective. We had this about the, the wife, and about uh, your sisters. Uh, again, to review, pray, verses 1 to 43. Lord, I don't want to be an adulterous wife. I want to be faithful to you. I don't want to look at another uh, temptation. And also, uh, don't be like your sisters. I've had people in my family who have sinned, who failed. Uh, I've sinned, and I've failed at times. I don't want to have to follow them. I've got a propensity to go down this track that a relative had. I don't want to go down that track. Uh, I'm going to break that curse, that uh, genetic uh, or f f familiar line or a demonic line. Uh, I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm going to go and serve the Lord, not the devil and the old ways. Now, the parable of the two eagles. Here's a parable about the last king of Jerusalem, Zedekiah, who rebelled against the king of Babylon. Babylon had surrounded the city walls for about 30 months. You'd think that Zedekiah, with Jeremiah's prophecies, would give in, but he wouldn't. He tried to escape, and there was judgment as a result. So it's stated here in verses 1 to 10 uh, about uh, his rebellion. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, pose a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. See, God's trying to do anything he can to get their attention. We sometimes can't just hear straight words. We need riddles. Oh, that piques our interest, doesn't it? And parables, little stories that tell the point that God wants to make. A great eagle, and again, when you start to do a story, 
people get away from themselves. Sometimes they cannot handle the truth themselves. So we get our minds off of ourselves and onto other objects. In this case, a great eagle. Ooh, I like that story. Let's see where it goes. A great eagle with large wings and long pinions, full of feathers of various colors, came to Lebanon. Uh, so you see, Lebanon is just north of Israel. So he's got their attention off themselves, onto the eagle, and off of Israel or Jerusalem, onto Lebanon. Sometimes you can't tell the story straight. You got to get it a different way for them to understand it. One of the great uh, truths of storytelling. Um, so he's going to go ahead and say here, now he comes to the, uh, to the cedar and the highest branch, and he takes the cedar of the highest branch. Lebanon was known for their huge cedar trees. He comes and lops off that highest branch. He cropped off its topmost twig and carried it to a land of trade. He set it in a city of merchants. Then he took some of the seed of the land and planted it in a fertile field. He placed it by abundant waters and set it like a willow tree. Now already these people are thinking, what's he talking about? But he's got them interested. He's got them thinking. And when you're raising kids or you're talking to people, sometimes you talk over and over and your words just fall on deaf ears. But you try it a different way, tell a story, and they're perking up their ears. That's when you can get through. Well, it grew. It became a spreading vine of low stature. Its branches turned toward him, but its roots were under it. And so it became a vine, brought forth branches and put forth shoots. But there was another great eagle with large wings and many feathers, and behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and stretched its branches toward him from the garden terrace where it had been planted that he might water it. It was planted in good soil by many waters to bring forth branches, bear fruit, and become a majestic vine. So, thus says the Lord, will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots, cut off its fruit, and leave it to wither? All of its spring leaves will wither and no great power or many people will be needed to pluck it up by its roots. Behold, it's planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind tor torches it? It will wither in the garden terrace where it grew. So their interest is piqued. What are we talking about? So now he's going to explain it in verses uh, 11 to 21. Nebuchadnezzar is that big bird, the, big, the first eagle. He's going to take King Jehoiachin to Babylon. King Jehoiachin was the preceding king of Jerusalem. It was in 597 BC. He left Zedekiah to be the king, as we said. And then Egypt's going to entice Zedekiah to rebel in verses 7 to 10. We saw that it, just in three years, the results are going to be disastrous, but God's going to restore Israel in the millennium. So now he's going to do, do some explaining about these eagles and about the, uh, the twigs and the growth. Verse 12, say now to the rebellious house, do you not know what these things mean? Tell them. So when God piques your interest, he will also tell you the answer. I've had people have dreams. They wonder if it's of God. I said, ask him. Is this a sign from God? Ask him. If he shows you something, he will tell you and he will explain it to you. Indeed, the king of Babylon went to Jerusalem and took its kings and princes and led them with him to Babylon. So now this is the big, uh, the, the big bird in verse 1, the great king, or verse 3, the great king, that's Nebuchadnezzar. And he's coming now and he's taking the, the branch, the highest branch is the king of Jerusalem, King Jehoiachin. And he's taking it to a, to a land of trade, verse 4, taking it back to Babylon. Um, and so the kingdom is to be brought low in verse 14. But then verse 15, we, we see here now this is going to be uh, Zedekiah, the king of Israel. He rebelled against uh, Babylon uh, by sending his ambassadors to Egypt, trying to get help, that he might give them horses and many people. So Babylon was supposed to be taking Israel into captivity. Zedekiah was resisting it. When God tells you to do something, do it. You don't try to fight it. You don't try to go another way. And so they're now trying to fight it. They're trying to go to Egypt, trying to get resources for armament, horses and weapons. As I live, says the Lord, surely in this place where the king dwells who made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke with him in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. Nor will Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company do anything in the war uh, to be able to uh, deliver them. So they were trying to avoid going into captivity. 
God had spoken again and again through Jeremiah and Ezekiel saying, go into captivity. I'm punishing you and evicting you from the land. They were doing everything they could to dig their heels in. Sometimes uh, we're praying for something and it's not happening. We're trying to get deliverance in a certain situation and it's not happening. We're trying to get that lawsuit to be dismissed and it doesn't get dismissed. We're trying to get that sickness to go away and it doesn't go away. We're trying to get this relationship healed and it's not going away. We have uh, financial troubles and we're praying and, and it's not going away. What's wrong? Well, we need to say, God, what is wrong? Speak to my heart. Am I doing something wrong? Do I need to stop resisting you and go in the direction you're trying to take me? I, I'm digging in, I'm resisting, but it's not working. And so we try to resist, we try to resist, and it's about time to say, Lord, what's wrong? Am I missing something? Do I need to change? Do I need to submit to you? Do I need to submit to somebody else? Uh, what's going on? I've tried it my way and it's not working. And that's a tough thing for us to do. We have a certain way of handling things. We resist, we resist. Sometimes he has to say, let's go a different way. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? Well, it's not going to work that way. All right, verse 22. Here is the uh, result now of Israel in the millennium uh, coming to salvation. Thus says the Lord God, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. I'll crop it off from the topmost of your twigs, a tender one. So now I'm going to bring forth a tender one. That's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it. It'll bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. This will be Jesus. Under it will dwell birds of every sort people from all over the world. In the shadow of its branches they will dwell, and all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree, and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. So I think our lessons uh, on this matter of rebellion and restoration are pretty clear. Uh, in the bulletin I've got uh, for chapter 17, God cures our spiritual adultery, restoring us in his covenant. We need to search our hearts to make sure that we're faithful to him, that we are not looking at something else or someone else, and be restored to him through the covenant of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then chapter 17, uh, success comes not by our efforts, but by God's through his son. Israel was trying to go to Egypt to get help, and nothing was happening. And the lesson, as I just said, is when you're trying to do it man's way, you're trying to get help, you're trying to get healing, you're trying to get finances, trying to get free of an addiction, trying to get whatever, and it's not working, turn to God. Say, Jesus, what am I doing wrong? I should have come to you first, but I'm coming to you now. And he's always ready. And so there is rebellion, but the cure for rebellion is returning coming to the Lord Jesus, receiving his forgiveness, his restoration, and then becoming that beautiful bride that he wants for you to be. Revelation 19 says at the end of that tribulation time, as we are about to come back to earth from heaven, we are going to be adorned like a beautiful bride. But that wedding gown is not one that is just given to us. It's the precious, righteous works of the saints. So I want to be busy today making my wedding gown. I don't know how to sew, don't know how to do anything like that, but I know how by God's grace to do some good works. Lord, help us to make our own wedding gowns today and every day by doing the good works, being your hands and your feet to reach out to people in your precious name. And then we'll be beautifully adorned and you're going to have that glory like that dear organist Helen whom I saw last night. She was getting younger by the moment as she talked about the Lord. She just radiated and youth was just springing forth from her. That should be our portion every day. Amen. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, thank you for your uh, study here in Ezekiel chapter 16 and 17. Help us not to rebel. And when we do, help us to repent and come back. If we've hurt somebody else, help us to make it right. If we have done something wrong with you, we've neglected you, help us, Lord, to come back to you. And Lord Jesus, we ask you right now to forgive us for our sins, come into our lives, live your precious and beautiful life in us. Make us beautiful with your beauty, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.